And Job was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it and said that day, the king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as a people who are ashamed to steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face and the king cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and the lives of your side chicks, in that you love. <laughs> Sorry, that's my translation. I don't know. I know what y'all are reading out of mindset, side chicks. Oh, I'm sorry, concubines. Anyway, it's <laughs> in, that <laughs> in that you love your enemies and hate your friends, for you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today, I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now, therefore, arise. Go out and speak comfort to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. David, you're about to lose it all. You don't pull your... You ever had that good friend? Some of y'all don't got friends like that. That's why you need to get a connect group, because you need a real friend. Not a friend trying to keep you. need a friend that'll snatch you up. You ever had a friend snatch you up sometime? Like, if you don't pull yourself together, then the king arose and sat in the gate. And they told all the people, saying, There is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for every one of Israel had fled to his tent. God, our prayer today is that you be magnified, that you be glorified. As John the Baptist prayed, our prayer is that we might decrease. God, that you may increase. God, do what only you can do. Do it in our lives. Do it in our families. Do it in our church. Do it in our communities. Do it in our nation, God. We're believing that what you do in us spills out and impacts every single person we encounter. And Father God, we will be ever so careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody shout amen. And amen and amen. As I said, we're starting a brand new series entitled Help, I Am Not Okay. I'm not okay. And today's message is entitled I Thought I Was Okay Until Dot, Dot, Dot. You, you ever had something, and, and as I was preparing this message, I was, I was thinking about the car that I drove in college, but you ever had something that it, it wasn't broken, it just wasn't working? Hold on, you'll catch up, you'll catch up. Do I need to say that again? You ever had something that it wasn't broken, it just wasn't working? Some of y'all have been rich your whole life, you don't have an idea what I'm talking about. When, when I say it, it wasn't broken, it just wasn't working, what I mean was, it, it was working enough to do what you needed it to do. It's just not all the features quite worked properly. I had this car uh, back in college. I was so proud of this car. It was a Lexus LS400, 1992, illegal tint, chrome rims, 13-inch sub in the trunk. Y'all, I rode up freshman year at Maryland like, ah. You could tell me nothing. And I, I, I worked kind of driving. I was a courier for my dad's company, so I'd get out of class every day, and I'd drive all the way up to Annapolis and all over kind of that, that uh, what, what would that be, Western Maryland kind of area. And uh, after a while, I noticed that there was just like this loud, like creaking sound every time I turned the steering wheel. So I went to the mechanic, and the mechanic was like, look, you've got a, a leak in your steering column. We got to fix the leak in your steering column because all the steering fluid keeps leaking out. I said, how much is it to fix the leak? I don't remember exactly, but it was more than I had. 
like two grand or something like that. I said, will the car break down? He said, no, you just got to keep making sure you pour steering wheel fluid in it. I said, I could do that. Don't bother to fix it. Just put it back together. Pay a little $75, you know, exploratory fee and let me get out of here. <laughs> Went down to AutoZone, got me a crate of steering wheel fluid. And every other day, just pour a little steering wheel fluid in there and we're good to go. A little spot where I parked at at school, the little puddle just got bigger and bigger and bigger. But that's all right. Just pour the fluid because it worked. It was just broken. Then I drove it for a few more months, and then, y'all, my dashboard went black. That was a tough one. You know how hard it is to drive and not know how fast you're going? <laughs> you know how, how much, I'm about to say how scary, but how much faith you need to not know how much gas you have? Do I stop? Do I go? When the same mechanic, how much is it to put a new dash in? Joker said something like four grand. I said, no. <laughs> what got me one of them Garmin GPSs? You know, the one that tells you how fast you're going in the little corner? I said, that's my speed. If I put gas in every 48 hours, I should be good. One day I was at work and I was taking a break, eating lunch or whatever. So I, I reclined my seat back to take a quick nap. It was like one of those, you know, those motorized seats. As I was going back, I heard a pop. So this ain't good. Went to put the seat back up. It wouldn't come back up. <laughs> Got in the back seat, tried to push it up as I was putting. The thing just stayed in recline. At this point, I didn't bother to go to the mechanic. I, I knew he didn't have any good news for me, but the car still ran. A leak, leak in the steering wheel fluid. Just put a little fluid in there. Dashboard black. That's all right. Got my little Garmin. Let me know how far to go. And, Go to gas station every 48 hours, seat. Boy, after that summer, my back hurt so bad. You know how hard it is to drive and you can't lean back at all? Just nothing but air. <laughs> Went on like this for about 12 months. And then one day I was late for work. 12, listen, y'all, it was college, y'all. I never got no $2,000, fix no car. I got to get some books. <laughs> Late for work as normal, jump in the car. But hey, listen, I was raised right, okay? I laid hands on that and I said, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus you will come alive. Guess what, y'all? That thing turned on. I was like, won't he do it? About 15 minutes later, I'm sitting on a red light. Cars, some cars are gracious. They'll have a conversation with you and they will tell you, I'm about to quit. When are you going to quit? Tomorrow? No, in about five minutes, I'm going to quit. <laughs> How did my car tell me? Well, it coughed twice, burnt, and then gave up the ghost. <laughs> I sat at every light for three hours. So apparently, I didn't pay for the towing on this insurance either. <laughs> you know, sometimes life can give you warnings. It's working, but it's broken. And because we're kind of moving and shaking and running, we can say, oh, I just got to put a little steering wheel fluid in it. That's okay. I'll fix it later. Oh, I, yeah, but can I still get from point A to point B? And if so, I'll deal with it later. And a lot of us, like me, it's not until life leaves us on the side of the road stranded. They were like, man, I probably should address that. When I say life, I'm really talking about your heart. I'm really talking about your soul. Because some of us, if we'd be honest, okay, let me just, can I just preach your message? All of us. <laughs> If we'd be honest, we're running, we're raising kids, we're going to work, we're pursuing degrees, we're paying bills, we're doing life, we're laughing, and we're leaking at the same time. I've, I've got stuff to do. I, I don't have the bandwidth to deal with that heartbreak. 
I, 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 some of us, we had loved ones that passed away, and, and because you're the key figure in the family, you didn't even have time to mourn them because you had to keep everybody stable. You had to plan the funeral, and you had to do this and make sure everybody got in. By the time everybody got in, they had their good morning. They went off back to their home, and now you're back at work and realize I never got time to actually face the reality of my life. And what we do is we kind of just sweep that grief or sweep that disappointment or sweep whatever it is into some corner, and we say, hey, it's, it's broken, but it still works, so I'll deal with it later. If we'd be honest, later becomes never. And then never becomes the most inopportune time where you find yourself stranded on the side of the road for three hours waiting for an emotional tow truck to pick you up. That's, That's where David found himself. David had spent a lifetime kind of just sweeping disappointment, sweeping trauma, sweeping setbacks, sweeping grief, sweeping loss into a corner. He had to. He was the king. He had all these people that were relying on him. He had all these people that were looking to him. He had all these people that he had to be there for. And because he had so many people to be there for, he he couldn't quite spend bandwidth thinking about himself. Until it all came crashing down. This moment was supposed to be a celebratory moment. David had been running for his life. Somebody had tried to overthrow his kingdom. They had actually gotten some of his military to be on their side. They were literally battling for David's life. Not only that, David at this point was too old to fight for himself. They said, King, if you go out to war, you're surely not going to come back. Let us fight for you. So Joab, his general, and the soldiers that were loyal to him went out to fight on David's behalf. Not only did they fight, but they defeated the enemy. They rescued David's life. The only problem was David's enemy was his own son. It wasn't some foreign country. It wasn't some some person across the sea. It wasn't some enemy. It wasn't some idolater. It was the boy that was raised in his own home. It was a culmination of David's pain, David's parenting. And he just couldn't take it anymore. The Bible says that as the troops came back, and, and you, you, you've watched enough television. I know television ain't real and television ain't Bible, but you've got enough imagination to know back in the day when they used to fight with swords and shields that when they would come back victorious, there would be a parade back into the city of we went out and we came back not on our shields, but we came back victorious. And the king, the king did not go. Then the king would be at the gate to welcome all the warriors that had risked their life to save that city. And as the soldiers came marching back in, whispers began to go because they began to say, hey, where's David? He's supposed to be here saying, good job. He's supposed to be here saying, what a victory. He's supposed to be here saying, man, you guys did it. And he was missing in action. Here's what happens. I can only sweep trauma and grief and disappointment in the corner enough. And then at some point, I will be missing in action. I know I'm not okay when there's times to celebrate and I don't feel like celebrating. I know I'm not okay. Uh Uh-oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Thanksgiving's coming, y'all. It's time to be with family. (laughs) Miss me. (laughs) Let's spend Thanksgiving away this year. I know there's something going on on the inside. When it's time to celebrate, it's time to, to be present. And as hard as I try, there's not much in me to present. Over the next four weeks, if it's okay with you, and it is okay with you because I'm not asking permission, we're going to dig in some corners. Is that okay? I'm pro- we're going to laugh. We're going to cry. It's going to be great. Don't, don't skip out on church the next four weeks. It's not going to be bad, but there's some stuff that, that we've stuffed in a corner that if we don't pull it out, it's going to come out. 
at the least opportune time. Let me give you just three quick thoughts, three quick thoughts. The, the, the first thing is this. It, it's hard to realize I'm not okay. It's really hard to realize I'm not okay. One of the reasons why I love Scripture, False Church, is because God's Word unpacks the wisdom of God, the truth of God, the revelation of God, but it also shows you real life. And if you only get the truth and the wisdom and the revelation and you don't see it lived out in real life, you can get discouraged thinking everybody else has it together. And then you read about Abraham and realize he was jacked up. Moses and his mama jacked up. And just on and on and on. We, we come to David and you, you want to talk about the goat, which would be LeBron, but the biblical goat. Let me build my case since I have the microphone and you don't. <laughs> Y'all might say Jordan was the GOAT. Nobody knew Jordan until college. They weren't worried about him. Yeah, he went to UNC, whatever, you know, one year, whatever. Yeah. At like 14, they're like, there's a little kid. He can't drive yet, but he'll be the greatest there ever was. Let's just call him the king now. That was David, y'all. They didn't wait for David to become king. When, when he was a little boy, David killed a lion with his bare hands. Look at your neighbor say, gangster. That's, listen, I don't care where you come from. That's gangster. <laughs> and if a lion wasn't enough, then he decided, oh, let me just one up. Let me go for the bear. Help the bear. <laughs> gangster. Many theologians believe he wasn't even 16 yet. When he had already killed a lion, had already killed a bear, you know the story. His resume just goes on and on and on. He goes just to bring his siblings something to eat, ends up toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath and defeats Goliath when an entire army of trained men want nothing to do with it. That was just his beginning. That's before he got drafted. <laughs> As a rookie, the Bible says he killed tens of thousands by himself to the point where they started singing songs about him that he could do more than the current king could do. He was anointed king above all of his brothers who were taller, stronger, the Bible says better looking. Not only that, David unified the entire nation of Israel. At the time, it was Israel and Judah, and David brought them together, not under war, but under the fact that he was a great leader. David, not only that, but he ended his life saving money and raising enough money to build the temple of the Lord. Where God said, you're not the one to do it, but as long as you've got the funds, your son will be able to do it. And the temple that David's son Solomon built was the greatest temple that had ever built for the Lord up to that point. And hear me, the greatest temple that has ever been built since. Somebody say, that's a resume. And with all that, he still was not okay. Here's the problem. We've got this mindset of what a person looks like when they're not doing well in their soul. And the picture that we have is of somebody who is completely just falling apart. We've got that picture of that person that they're a, they're a social recluse. They're locked in their house. They've, they've got no friends. They, they can't keep a job. They can't keep a bill. You, you, you go in their house and it looks like a hoarder's house. There's just boxes and clothes and food and all. That's our picture of somebody who's not doing all right. So when we look in the mirror and we see our degrees, we see our net worth, we see our success, we, we see our friends, we see all the tapestry, we begin to look at our resume, we begin to think, you know what? I'm doing Doing all right. There's no way somebody could show up to work like this and perform that way and not be okay. I mean, yeah, I've got some bad days. I've got some moments, but for the most part, nobody could do what I do and not be okay. Or we think the amount of people that we're in relationship with dictates or indicates how healthy we are. Unhealthy people, they don't have friends. They're, they're losers, you know. They're, they're weird. <laughs> I've got people who love me. I've got people who want to be around me. I, I've got people who know me. I've got people who wish they were me. Clearly. Bible says this in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. 
What good would it do to get everything you want? Watch this. This is a message, uh, a paraphrase. And lose you. Like this phrase. The real you. What could you ever trade your soul for? Sometimes the magnitude of our success is an indication of how unhealthy we are. I'm so great in my career because I'm running from something I don't want to deal with. So when I don't want to have those thoughts, I just work. And when I don't want to deal with that, I just work. And when I don't want to have to worry about that, I just work. And guess what happens when you work? You move forward. You progress. You you have success. People pay you. You get progress. And you begin to think that that progress is an indication of I'm okay, when really that progress is an indication that there's something I'm running from and I don't want to deal with it. We've got this mindset that as long as I've got people in my life and I'm able to relate and connect and all that other good stuff, that that's an indication that I'm okay, I'm healthy, because who would want to be in relationship with somebody who's unhealthy? So I'm here for this friend, I'm here for that friend, I'm here for that family member, I'm here for this family member. What in reality, what I'm doing is I'm ignoring my own heart for the sake of everybody else's. And if I spend all my energy fixing other people's problems, I won't actually have to acknowledge that... I'm not okay. And we spend so much energy fooling everybody else, and I'm not talking at you, I'm talking with you. Hear me. We end up fooling ourselves. We don't realize there's something going on here. How do I know when I'm not okay? When I'm supposed to show up at one way in one situation, and I'm missing in action. Hey, David, it's time to celebrate. He's curled up in the fetal position, mourning a son that tried to kill him, but he probably blames himself for. Some indications of how do I know that I'm not okay. When I self-sabotage, sometimes the self-sabotage is in relationships. It does not matter who I date when I date. It doesn't matter who the friend is, who the neighbor is, who the coworker is. Just, I know me, give me 12 months, and I will say something. I will do something. That, and, and what we do is the first three or four people, we say it's them. Come on now. Well, they just couldn't deal with my success. They, they, didn't, they didn't like that I keep it 100 I just, you know, some people just don't like to keep it 100. No, bro, you were 250. That was not. (laughs) One person might have been their fault. Three people, all right, they were soft. Four, five, six, seven. Some point, God pulled that mirror out. Come on now. How do I know something's not okay when I self-sabotage my destiny? I'm, I'm running after this career or this calling or this ministry or whatever it may be, and I get 18 months down the road, and somehow every single time I do something that starts me over. How do I know I'm not okay? Can I tell you what happened to me? My body shut down. Some of us, it's relationships. Some of us, it's the progress of our careers. Some of it, our physical body just says, bruh, I quit. (laughs) When? Now. (laughs) One of the things I try to do is I try not to preach from good thoughts, but Journeys that God has taken me on, as you may or may not know, I became the senior pastor of, of, of a church at 23 years old, and we just started running, and God just started blessing the church. We went from 150 to 250, 250 to 400, 400 to 800, 800 to 1500, 1500 to 3000. Do you know what happens when you go from 50 to 3000 in less than 10 years? 
People come and people go. People make promises and people don't keep them. People said, I'll be here till the end, and then they roll out the first opportunity they can. People grab knives and they twist, twist, twist. I didn't have the luxury. Just, you just keep going. You just keep going. You just keep going. Then we hit 2020, and the whole world decides, let's go back in the Old Testament and have a plague. <laughs> Golly. You ever thought that? Come on now. You been in the middle of a pandemic. Did I read this in Leviticus number? Like, <laughs> thought this was Moses' time. We should be done with this. Come on now. And it's like, no, plague's not enough. Let's go racial wars and political unrest. You ever try to pastor a church where no two people think the same? This side says this and this side says that. And you're supposed to stand up and give a word for everybody. Knowing half the room's going to be ticked off no matter. And some of you are like me. I pride myself in my tolerance for pain. I, I, I pride myself in the fact that when I'm stressed, you can't tell. Because this is me happy. <laughs> this is me angry. <laughs> this is me stressed. Am I the only one? I thought it was a badge of honor to be able to take pain. And I didn't see it showing up in my relationships, even though it probably was. And I didn't see it showing up in my career. And God says, I've got to get your attention. Next thing you know, my body just says, I quit. Started out with just like, like just, and I'm grabbed, just stomach pains. Like, oh, I'm in pain. This hurts. Okay. Then it turned into so much stomach pain, like I couldn't make the meeting. I'm in my office curled up. It's not good. Then I noticed, you know, if I eat, the pain goes away. So I start eating <laughs> all the time. And after a few months, that didn't make the pain go away. And then I realized if I take some, you know, antiacids, some Tums or whatever, it maybe that works. And that, I, come on, I did my body the same way I do my car. <laughs> it broke, but it's still working, so let's go. And after a while, the, the antiacid didn't work. And, you know, I'm, I'm real smart. That's why y'all let me be the pastor. I said, hey, maybe I should go to the doctor. <laughs> Go to the doctor, they tell the 30, what was that back then? 33? Yeah, ulcers. What? That, no offense. That's old people stuff. <laughs> they ain't even 40 yet. The doctor said, What do you do for a living? <laughs> I said, bro, you don't got time. You don't, <laughs> you don't got time. He said, I bet it's something stressful. He said, I'm bet you're hiding it because this that you're experiencing is stress. It's going to show up some way. Yeah. Bible says this in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in. And how are you going to prosper and keep your health? And your heart's okay. And if your heart's okay, you can't sweep it in the corner forever. At some point, you're going to end up on the side of the road waiting for a tow truck. Say, man, I should have dealt with that. Second thing is this, write this down. Ignored health always steals. Ignored health always we, we We kind of do what I did. We just kick the can down the field. I'm in pain, but it's not that much pain. We'll be all right. As long as I eat before nine, I'm good. Hey, if I could grab, the next thing you know, every night you're taking a sleep aid. Every night you're doing this or you're just to kind of kick the dick hand down the field, not realizing that whether it's your relationships, whether it's your career or whether it's your physical body, it's literally, it's like the fire detector going off in your soul. Hey, there's smoke. You might want to check. And it's not just that you burnt the bacon. <laughs> Go check this out. We know David's resume of success. What a lot of people don't know is that with a resume of success, he also had a resume of trauma. 
Because, yeah, he was a prodigy from young that killed a lion and a bear, but he was also a little boy that no matter what he did, his father was not impressed. From young, his dad said, nope, 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 nope. I've got other sons that I think can do better than you. I'm not really interested in what God has for the future of your life. And in spite of his father not seeing who he was, God was still able to promote him. And God actually promoted him right into the king's palace. And here is David, anointed by God, spending time in God's presence, but still looking for somebody of a father figure to acknowledge him. And for a season, that father figure in King Saul acknowledged him until David turned out to be more anointed than his mentor. Then as soon as that happened, his mentor turned into his tormentor, and the one that he looked to acknowledge him was now throwing spears at him. But I'm called, I'm gifted, I'm anointed, I don't have time to deal with this, so I keep on marching forward. There was one man that did acknowledge David and saw what God had called David to do. It was actually his, you, you could say it was his pastor, Samuel, the prophet, was called by God, anointed David, saying, God has called you to be the king of Israel. God's going to do great things through your life. Finally, somebody saw and acknowledged David. And then the one person who valued David died before anything they said over David's life could come to pass. The one who told me I'd be king never got to see it. The one who told me that God would use me in a great way was never here. And he ain't even king yet. Then the king says, man, I think so much of you, you should marry my daughter, but you're too poor to. You can't afford it. Then David finds a way to be able to marry the daughter, and he marries the daughter, and she's disgusted with him. You're an embarrassment. What what type of kid? This sounds like a therapy session. Somebody somebody needs to take David and put him on a couch. Okay, when I draw this picture, how does it make you feel? And then what happened? Come on now. And then his kids try to kill him. The soldiers turn on him, and he just keeps trucking and trucking and trucking, kicking the can down the field, kicking the can down the field, until this one day in 2 Samuel 19, David's soul says, I can't take it anymore. What we don't realize is when we ignore what we sweep into the corner and kick the can down the field, all we are doing is increasing the explosion at the end. Here's what it says in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 6. This is David kicking the can down the field. Now his father, this was Adonijah's father, which was David. King David had never disciplined him at any time. Not so much as by a single scolding fall shirt. Yeah, imagine having a kid, they're 35 years old, and you've never corrected them once in their life. It's called a monster. <laughs> Why? Why didn't he correct him? Because he was a very handsome man. And was Absalom's younger brother. Here's what we think. We think the unhealth of our soul, especially we were taught this in church, will only show in sinful ways. Sin is not the only way unhealth shows. Sometimes it just shows in us not having our responsibility. Sometimes it shows with us wanting to be our kids' friends instead of their parents. Sometimes it shows with, well, my parents were harsh, so I don't want to be that. So now I'm going to overcorrect and make sure I don't make that. Here it is, David, up, that did it that way. Well, I'm never going to ask my sons what they're doing. I'm never going to correct them. And... Unlike my dad, I'm going to favor the younger because that's the one that my dad rejected. And here's what happened. Sean, you could come play. We're going to land this plane. I'm going to encourage you before we land it, so don't worry about it. What happens is when we begin to notice this unbalance in our actions, our relationships, or whatever it may be, we tell ourselves, hey, I'm just going to do something different. Don't play yet. I'll do this, and then we'll get there. I'll let you know. Hang out. (laughs) 
we, 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 I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up. I'm gonna trust more. I'm gonna rest more. I'm gonna start. I'm, and what we will notice is I will do something different for about three months. And I'll just find myself leaking back into the old me. And I'll be honest with you, three years ago, as I'm kind of walking through this, God, uh, you're trying to show me something that's showing up in my body. I'm not handling stress right. What, what? And he took me on this journey where he said, Stephen, it does not start with changing your actions because your actions are just the fruit. Your actions are not the root. And he said, Stephen, you've got to get to the root before you can change the Is it all right if I take you on the journey God took me on? And we'll do this over the next four weeks, but let me just kind of give it to you and then we'll unpack it for a minute. He said, Stephen, your actions are based on your decisions. And in order to change your action, you've got to change your decisions. Like, okay, God, I'm ready to change my decision. He said, but you can't change your decisions until you change the lies you've believed. Because the decisions you make that are opposite to my best for your life are based on some lie that you've believed. And the lie got to change before the decision got to change and the decision got to change before your action got to change. I said, okay, God, I'm ready uh, uh, to change the lie. He said, I can't change the lie until we heal the wound. Because you picked up that lie when you were wounded in that place. And until I heal you from that wound, you'll always believe that lie, which will affect your decisions, which will affect your actions. And I said, well, Lord, heal my wounds. <laughs> Here's the whole message. He says, Stephen, I can't heal your wound until you acknowledge your trauma. Because until you acknowledge that hurt. Do you know how hard it is just to say that hurt? Especially if the person that hurt you wasn't intentional. They were doing the best that they could. Maybe a loved one passed away. It was completely out of their control. And because it was out of their control, I can't blame them. Can't blame God. I've got too much faith for that. Because I don't know who to blame, I can't acknowledge that hurt. Hurt, hurt, it hurt. My mama wasn't there when I got married. It hurt. I'm not blaming anybody, but God says, until you can say that hurt, you won't even acknowledge that there's a wound. And if there's a wound that you won't acknowledge, here's what the, the enemy will always come and tell you why you hurt. And after a while, you begin to believe that lie. And then that lie dictates your decisions and that decision dictates your actions. He said, hey, we'll walk you. But first, I just got to get you to acknowledge. Help! <laughs> yeah. Go to union kids. All right. <laughs> Somebody say, help, I'm not okay. Come on, can you say that like three times? Somebody say, help, I'm not okay. Come on, two more times. Somebody say, help, I'm not okay. One more time. Come on, somebody say, help, I'm not okay. You know what happens when you realize you're not okay? You realize I'm human. I ain't Superman. I'm not God. I'm not made of Teflon. I'm made of flesh and bones. I'm made of skin and blood. I, 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 I get nicked up sometimes. I get hurt sometimes. I got set back sometimes. I get overwhelmed sometimes. I, 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 I break down sometimes, okay? It doesn't mean I'm not strong. It just means I'm human. Some of us have been told our whole life, stop crying. Some of y'all need a good cry. Some of y'all just, just. <laughs> Write this down. But it didn't break me. And 
because it didn't break me, now the Lord can make me into who he has called me to be. We're going to spend the next three weeks healing wounds and changing lies and restoring decisions and seeing our actions no longer being self-sabotaging, but moving us towards what God has for us. But before we heal anything, can we just take a moment and marvel at yourself after all you've been through, every setback, every trauma, every difficulty, every discouragement, all the abuse, and you're still here? You're still loving God? You're still giving your all to your kids? You're still giving your all to your spouse? You're still employed? You're still paying bills? You're still going to work every day? You're still loving friends? You're still forgiving enemies? You're still walking in all the things of God? Can you take a moment and just pat yourself? Even if nobody else has said you've done a good job, all you've been through, all the pain, all the setback, all the discouragement, and you're still trucking, you still move. The person next to you doesn't even know that you're the first to graduate and everybody said that you'll never be able to do it. They have no idea at work that you go home to a house where it's just you. You ain't got no help. You don't got no support, but you're still trusting God. You're still, it didn't break you. It didn't break you. It didn't break you. I know there's so much, but it didn't break you. Can you take about 30 seconds and just give God glory that with all I've been through, all the trauma, all the setback, all the difficulty, all the labels, all the stereotypes, all the abuse, all the pain, and I'm still here, I'm still walking, I'm still praising, I'm still shouting, I'm still singing, I'm still believing, I still got vision, I still got hope, I still got faith, I'm still believing that my best days are ahead of me, they're not behind behind me. It didn't break me. It didn't break me. And some of us don't want to acknowledge that we've been through some stuff because we feel like it's an indication of our weakness. And if you would just look at all you've been through, but yet all you've accomplished that's not an indication of weakness. You're a walking miracle. So here's my challenge. If God could bring you this far when you're not at 100, if you could accomplish all that you've accomplished, Limping through that pain and that setback and that imagine what he could do with you whole. Imagine what he could do if you didn't need the three days to check out. The question is, are you gonna acknowledge God? I'm not okay. I don't even know what to do with it, but I'm just 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, message paraphrase says, I don't know about you, but I'm running hard to the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No lazy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping. Watch this. Telling everyone else all about it. And then missing out myself. You know what happens when we don't acknowledge that we're not okay? Everybody around us is blessed except for us. Everybody else is blessed at our own expense. Career is going forward, but it's killing me on the inside. Kids are happy. I feel like I'm losing them. And Paul made a decision in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that I'm hoping you'll make today. Paul said, I'm not going to be there for everybody else and lose myself in the process. I'm not going to encourage your faith and tell you how great God is and, and tell you to keep going. Whole time I went, Paul said, I'm not going to get selfish, but I'm going to let God do in me what I'm telling everybody else he can do for them because I don't want to cheer everybody else onto their finish line and then myself be disqualified. Hear me, Union Church. 
You're not weak because you've been through something. You're human. I got one more verse in you, then we pray. Jeremiah 18, verse 2 says this. Go down to the potter's shop, and I'll speak to you there. So, some of the Bible is poetry, and it gives you this image. Just, just have this image of this man sitting, and this wheel is spinning in front of him, and he has this pottery, this vase that he's making. So Jeremiah says, so I did as he told me. And I found the potter sitting, working at his wheel, but the jar he was making, it didn't turn out how he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay. And he started over. Union churches, is it okay if the potter starts over in your life? Is it okay if the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords says, I didn't create you to be this broken. If you don't mind, I'd like to reform you, reshape you, rebuild you. I, I want to build your confidence again. I, I want to build your vision again. I, I want to build your self-esteem again. I, I want to build your self-worth again. The, the Bible says that we are jars of clay, that we actually house the glory of God. And God said, listen, it didn't go the way I had hoped it to go. I, I I didn't want you to walk through that setback. I didn't want you to walk through that abuse. But since you did, I'm a God that's able to remake you, reform you, remold you. I'm able to make it that they don't even see what you've been through, what I'm done, what I'm doing. Hear me. We serve a God union church that is remaking us in his presence. Father God, we're grateful. God, we're thankful. God, you don't leave us marred, bruised, scarred, trampled, and ignored. But you said that you remake us. You said if any man, if any woman be in Christ, they're a new. God, we pray that you'd make us new. But it starts with us saying, God, help. God, help. We're not okay. God, we need you to do what only you can do in our lives. Right where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And in a moment, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. For some of you, God is saying, instead of feeling shame, you should feel pride. Why are you ashamed? You didn't quit. You know how many people quit going through what you've been through? You didn't throw in the towel. You, you didn't curse God and say it doesn't matter anymore. For some of you, hear me, the Bible says that God is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. And he's just waiting for you to let him in. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in church and you know church. You know uh, when to stand, when to sit, when to shout. But if you'd be honest, you never let God into your heart. Or maybe you're new to an atmosphere like this and you didn't even know that God wants to be a part of your life. Well, he wants to. And hear me, it starts with you acknowledging, God, I need you. Wherever you find yourself, you say, I need God in my life. Can you pray this prayer? It's this simple. Say, God, I need you. I can't do this by myself. Thank you for dying on the cross so that all of my sin, all of my mistakes, all of my pain can be erased. In this moment, I surrender. I give you all of me. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Come on, can you celebrate for every single person? Can 
you do me a favor? We're going to close in a second. Can, can, can you touch about two people? You're going to have to get up on your feet for this. But can you touch about two people? Tell somebody you didn't quit. Come on, tell somebody. Tell somebody you didn't quit. You're still here. You're still here. You're still trucking. You're still moving forward. I don't know if anybody's encouraged you lately, but you're doing better than you think you are. You're doing better than you think you are based on what you've walked through, based on what you've experienced. Your, your shields shouldn't be in your right mind. You, you shouldn't still have hope, but you do. And if he brought you this far, he did not bring you this far to leave you. Your best days are ahead of you. They're not behind you. You will see the goodness of the Lord on this side of eternity. If you believe it, somebody shout amen. Hallelujah.